Welcome to Dreamland. This is Marla Fries. Well, my guest today has worked for over 17 years for the military and has trained hundreds of students in remote viewing. His company, PSI, Problems, Solutions, and Innovations, is dedicated to training people in the strict science of controlled remote viewing and has offered the services to private citizens, companies, agencies, and other customers who need information which cannot be gained through any other means. His book, which we'll be talking about today, The Seventh Sense, is an in-depth account of the secrets of remote viewing as told by a psychic spy for the U.S. military. He is a terrific teacher and an all-around great guy, and I am so honored to have him on our program today. Welcome, Lynn Buchanan. Hey, that introduction makes me want to meet me. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> well, well, that's the truth. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Well, uh, Lynn, I know that there's so many listeners who are interested in what remote viewing really is. So how can you, can you give us a little overview of what controlled remote viewing is? Okay, I'm glad you said controlled remote viewing because that is the method that was used by the U.S. military for intelligence gathering for, oh, close to 20 years. And um, I was the military trainer in that unit uh, the last years I was in service. But the controlled remote viewing is a science that was developed in the laboratory at Stanford Research Institute um, to mimic the work of uh, natural psychic. They, um, they found out that the uh, Russians had psychic spies, and they had a really good laugh over that, you know. Right. But then they realized, yeah, but they're getting our secrets. Mm. And uh, so all of a sudden somebody started taking it seriously. And so they figured, well, if the Russians have it, we have to have it, too. What year was that, Lynn? Oh, that was back in, I think, 69 or 70, somewhere around there. Okay. Uh, it, was a, it was a process that went through, you know, the realization, the finding out that the uh, Russians had it and so forth. And uh, so it was, a, it was a decision that was, you couldn't put an exact date on. But the... Uh, uh, U.S. military, because of the politics in the United States and everything, did not want to use psychics. So they um, went out to Stanford Research, where a man named uh, Dr. Hal Putoff had been doing some research on uh, what's now called non-locality, hmm. um, how the how the mind can perceive things. Um, that, you know, are beyond the five normal senses. And so they gave him a grant of around $50,000 to develop some kind of a method. And um, he got in touch with uh, a man named Pat Price, who was a retired um, policeman, and a man named Ingo Swan, who had been doing some research in this. And they developed a technique that could be used by just the common soldier on the ground to uh, emulate the the work of a natural psychic. Well, I think the the aspects of controlled remote viewing is is so important because you know people are throwing the idea around that oh I can remote view I can remote view but this is this is a highly skilled detailed uh, way to do this. Oh yes, it's a uh, martial art of the mind, really. That's a wonderful way of putting it. So how long did it take Ingo to develop this protocol? Oh, uh, several years. I think he had been developing this protocol long before he got in touch with uh, Al Putoff. And um, basically they brought, uh, they brought Ingo into the laboratory and they said, you know, uh, tell me what's in the box. <clears throat> and... Ingo basically said, hey, you're wasting my time and talents. If you want to know what's in the box, open the box. <laughs> and uh, he said, give me the coordinates for any place in the world, and I'll tell you what's there and what's going on there. Wow. And so they tried it out on several places, and he did just exactly that. And um, so 
they started codifying what could be done with this methodology and uh, designing it so that, you know, you could pull a, a grunt soldier off the battleground, teach him how to do this, and send him back so he could tell his commander what was over the hill and where to point the guns and things like that. Well, so how did they pull you all together to do this? Uh, they had had the unit for about 10 years before I got there. Um, due to a uh, psychokinesis incident that happened in uh, over in Augsburg, Germany. Oh, you are you going to share that? Because it's quite a story. <laughs> well, oh, please. Oh, if, if listeners are going to hear anything today, they've got to hear this story. I had spent about five months working, uh, developing a computer program that would tie together all of the uh, computers within the U.S. Uh, intelligence field station over in Germany. Now, we had computers from 12 different companies, uh, uh, countries, and uh, old computers, new computers, everything, you know, and they weren't talking to each other. So anyway, I got the program written after about five months, and uh, this other sergeant had been extremely angry because he wanted the job to do it. And so when the day came for me to show my program, he sabotaged it. And I had the generals from 12 different countries sitting there. I hit the enter key, and uh, the entire fuel station went dead. And uh, so, you know, I... Was it your anger that shut it down? uh, I looked around, and everybody was laughing at me, you know. And I looked in the doorway, and there was this other sergeant, and he mouthed, gotcha and pointed his finger at me and I got flaming flaming angry Mm -hmm. well I have always had this uh, problem with anger that when I get really really mad something (laughs) something will break (laughs) yeah (laughs) and so anyway the computer station went down and uh, for the a time that's still classified in fact uh, we had no intelligence effort in uh along the uh, German border. Oh, my gosh. And so, anyway, um, uh, this general, General Stubblebein, had heard about the incident, and he came out a few months later and uh, uh, stood me at attention and had this scowl on his face, and he said, did you kill my computers with your mind? (laughs) And that was the last thing in the world I expected any general to say to me. (laughs) And uh, I was standing there thinking, my great-grandchildren are going to be paying for computers, (laughs) and uh, I could lie about this, and nobody would know, you know. And sort of out of my mouth, I heard the words, yes, sir, I did. (laughs) And anyway, the scowl disappeared, and this grin came over his face, and he said, far effing out. (laughs) Have I ever got a job for you? (laughs) That's great. So what he wanted me to do was he wanted to uh, bring me back to Washington, D.C. and form a unit that would, first of all, destroy enemy computers. (laughs) Sure. And then later learn how to not destroy them but to control the data within them. Mm. And so anyway, they brought me back to Washington, D.C., and... uh, He had to get funding from Congress for this new unit, and Congress said, you know, not no, but hell no. Right. And uh, because that's mites of mind control, and they had been caught doing mind control before. They weren't going to get caught doing that again. Oh, I see. So so anyway, there I was in Washington, D.C., no job, no assignment. So he took me by the uh, remote viewing unit stuck me into that, and I became a remote viewer. Wow. That's such a great story. And how many people were in the unit when you first got there? Uh, We never had more than six viewers at a time. And uh, then, of course, staff, you know, uh, staff usually of about three people. Um, the, uh, The bean counters loved us because every military unit has uh, personnel that have to be funded, and equipment that has to be funded. 
and in our unit, the personnel was the equipment. Right. So, uh, I mean, you know, they got us for half price. <laughs> yeah, pretty cheap, I would imagine. So, well, let's let's talk about this in just a second. I'm going to take a little break, and we'll be back, and we'll discuss more about what happened in that unit. Okay, sounds good. Next week on Dreamland, what are orbs? Just bits of dust on the camera lens or more? At last year's Dreamland Festival, Ann Streber was surrounded by orbs, so she's curious, and she's going to ask an expert, Antonia Scott Clark. Dreamland, serious wonder. In two weeks, don't miss our Christmas special, Whitley Streber and Danian Brinkley. It's a heartwarming, beautiful show, folks. It's going to run December 27th and January 3rd. Then, on January the 31st, our subscribers get to chat live with Danian Brinkley. You're listening to Whitley Streber's Dreamland Online with guest host Marla Freeze. Welcome back. This is Marla Freeze, and I have with me today Lynn Buchanan. So, Lynn, here you are in this new unit, psychic guys in the military, and you start identifying targets. What did you start doing? Uh, when I went in, it was during the Iranian uh, hostage uh, the crisis, you know. And um, so uh, the first week I went in, um, we got the word that the unit was being disbanded. Hmm. And come to find out, it had been disbanded every single year that it would had been in effect because it was only funded for one year at a time. Hmm. And every single year we had to go in and prove our work to some uh, intelligence subcommittee. And so um, uh, the following week, uh, we went in and proved, you know, or they went in and proved that they could do the work and that they were valuable. So um, then I started training, and uh, when they first showed me you know, when they first told me what they did uh, for a living as a unit, I thought, hey, I'm on candid camera. This is some kind of a big joke. You know, the military doesn't do this. Mm -hmm. And uh, sure enough, I started watching them work. And I was just amazed at the information they could get um, way beyond anything that I had ever seen any psychic get. Uh, you know, in detail, and, I mean, they would draw maps of locations, exact maps. Mm -hmm. uh, they could draw the um, the equipment that was at the location. They could give the number of personnel there. They could uh, actually get in and uh, <clears throat> find out the plans and intentions for the next day of battle. Fascinating. Uh, really, uh, between the time Ingo invented this, or you know, designed it, and uh, the military had put it to use for 10 years, um, they had done a lot of uh, improvement and a lot of, uh, you know, finessing of it. And so the end result was that they could do uh, things that, I mean, just bowled me over. Well, we, we need to also preface, I think, that um, the people that you train now aren't they're people from all walks of life they don't necessarily have to be psychic i mean i came in there and trained with you because i wanted to expand what i was working on but some of the best people in the class i think were accountants or something oh yeah uh, so how did you know how did they determine uh in the military who was going to be in this group i mean we have your story but what were the other people like well um the other people were in there uh some were there just because their name popped up in a computer whenever a, a slot opened up for them. Uh, some were in there because they knew someone. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of us were there because, first of all, we had to have a uh, you know set of security clearances that just uh, uh, way up over your head and everything. And uh, so they they looked for security clearances. Uh, they also looked for basically non-psychic people. Right. Um, this was never designed for psychics. Mm -hmm. Now, we teach a class for psychics where we teach the control 
but not the remote viewing. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, they come in with their talent already intact. And uh, if they apply those controls, I mean, they are just what we in Texas call barn burners. Uh, yeah, I, I had some problems. I, I had some problems. I remember tapping into a site and uh, starting to fall asleep and getting real cold, and I think the target was a, uh, a woman in a freezer in a yeah. rider van someplace in Arizona. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, that, it's pretty dicey for some of us like that. Oh, yeah, and... Uh, uh, you know, we have we have learned the hard way that you don't give targets like that to uh, <laughs> to people who are very empathic because uh, you know they can uh, they can really suffer for it. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I think I uh, I think I got seasick. One of my targets was a boat, and I think yeah. another one of my one of the funniest targets, Lynn, was um, I started uh, smelling hot dogs and hearing pops, you know, like pop, pop, like a gun popping and feeling very anxious. And my target was a cow going to slaughter. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got to be careful with us. <laughs> um, so tell me some of the things that you guys worked on. What What were the most fascinating – tell us some of your fascinating cases that you worked on. Uh, some of the most fascinating for me were uh, we did a um, uh, particle beam weapon over in uh, – in Russia, and uh, some of our customers needed to know basically what was going on inside the beam, and uh, so they asked for a volunteer remote viewer. You know, you can't stick instruments into the beam because the minute you turn it on, I mean, the thing is just uh, dissolved. Right. Nothing. Huh. And so um, they asked. Somebody got the brilliant idea of putting a remote viewer into the beam, and I volunteered for it. <laughs> it was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen, um, because in the beam, time itself is basically destroyed. And uh, within that beam, I could see up and down the entire length of my life as though it were thousands and thousands of different people that I could talk to. Wow. And... Uh, the uh, beam itself was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. What did it look yeah. like? Well, the bottom line was I brought the information back that our scientists needed to uh, find out what was going on with their particle beam weapon. But the uh, it was the most amazing thing that has ever happened to me, and I don't think I can ever fully explain it to anyone. But um, the minute I would realize the entire span of time. It would coalesce and I would be me again and then the minute I was me again it would expand back again and there was basically every every facet and every day of my life that was uh, just spread out in front of me up and down the beam. How fascinating. It's amazing. It's fantastic. Well what what actually happens to people, Lynn, when they start this work? When when they go through all the protocol, and the protocol is very specific. I mean, it's it's regimented, and you've got to follow it uh, step by step. But what is actually going on with the uh, the sitter's uh, psyche? What's going on with their unconscious? Uh, basically, what happens is the um, you know I said it's a martial art of the mind. The training uh, doesn't make you psychic. I mean, you know, people say everybody already is psychic. Mm -hmm. Well, then why aren't they doing the work? What this does is it trains you to talk on a very real basis to your subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. And your subconscious mind seems to have access to all the information that you'll ever need in the universe or in time and space. And um, this allows you to simply hold a conversation with your subconscious mind so that you can ask the question and get the answer. That is, that's a really wonderful way of saying it. I, and, and oh my God, that's why I think that this training is so awesome and so powerful just for the mere sake of getting to know who we are as individuals. Oh, yeah. When you start talking to your subconscious mind, uh, we teach it, you know. It was taught to us as intelligence collection because we could go out into the universe and get information that was exact. 
But the fact is, when you talk to your subconscious mind and you get to be friends with it and learn to hold a conversation, it knows what your phone number was when you were three years old. Oh. It knows why you do those things that you don't want to do, but you wind up doing them anyway. Mm -hmm. And um, it it has all of those information, all of that information, not just about the universe, but about you yourself. It's a phenomenal. Uh, well, the practicality of what it can do to teach you just about the, the vastness of our itty bitty teeny brains. I mean, the idea that our subconscious does know everything and this application will prove it is staggering. It really is, yeah. yeah well, so are. what is actually happening with this work now? Are they using it in the military? Oh, well, I don't know. You know, I retired. They don't tell me anything. <laughs> uh, I sincerely hope they are because I think it would be stupid not to. Mm -hmm. uh, that changes, of course, the question to, does our government ever do anything stupid? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Gee. Uh, I'm afraid I know the answer to that one already. But, uh, well, you know, the, the idea, when when I tell people about this work and they're, they say, well, you know, well, where's Osama bin Laden? Do you believe that they do know where he is? Oh, sure. We've known that yeah. all along. We know it. Uh, the fact is that they don't want to catch him. Right. And so, it's you know, not good for business, is it? Well, it's not good for uh, continuing a war. As soon as he gets caught, there's going to be people saying, okay, it's time to end the war. Mm -hmm. And, of course, they're, they're saying that already. But uh, anyway... That's that's into politics. I try to stay out of that. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll we'll stay out of that. And but maybe Whitley will talk about it. So get prepared. <laughs> so what is the application now for you? We are now using it for business, for a lot of police work, mm -hmm. uh, finding missing children, finding uh, missing evidence, uh, drug interdiction. We're using it for scientific uh, research and development. Uh, you know, for corporations and all. We, uh, not too long ago, did a uh, thing on uh, one one moon development company wanted us to tell them the best way to get a temporary moon base until a permanent moon base could be uh, built. Wow. And so what our remote viewers found by simply going into the future and looking at the temporary moon base that worked uh, was that if you take a huge sheet of uh, mylar plastic, which is very tough plastic and uh, flexible, and stretch it over a crater, then you have an, a uh, sealed environment. The crater acts as the walls and the plastic acts as the ceiling. You uh, fill it with... 16 pounds of pressure, which is air pressure at sea level. And that's about half of what you put in a bicycle tire. And uh, then, you know, if a meteorite strikes that plastic, you put some duct tape over it, and it seals the hole. It doesn't crash like a glass dome or a metal dome would. And, uh, and so when this company found out that the... Uh, temporary moon base could be built out of a roll of plastic and a bunch of rolls of duct tape. Uh, I mean, they were ecstatic. I bet. And so... Well, let's take a break here, and I want to come back and talk more about that. Okay. You're listening to Dreamland, serious wonder spoken here. Welcome back. We're here with Lynn Buchanan. So you're giving us a new idea for um, another way to seal our vegetables in the refrigerator. Is that what you're talking about, Lynn? <laughs> Or to seal people in the moon. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> this is fascinating. Uh, we've done a lot of archaeological work. Uh, one customer asked us uh, to look at a, uh, <clears throat> a thing that a diver had reported. And um, what we found was a pre-Mayan city that... Uh, that predates the Mayans by several centuries. Where is this? Uh, it's in the Atlantic. And what what was what was the protocol? They said, "Do what?" 
What was the, did you, did you have the target? Uh, no, they, they asked us to look at a section of the ocean. And, uh, we found, you know, we found a pyramid, we found the ruins of a city and all that. And, uh, so they sent down divers and sure enough, there's the pyramid. There's the old walls, crumbled, crumbled walls. That's amazing. All that, yeah. And what, did you, did you ever, uh, remote view Mars? Uh, yeah, personally, had to have. What'd you get? Well, that there was a civilization. Um, in fact, the first uh, what's called a PSI experience. Uh, uh, it's uh, perfect site integration is what it's called. Hmm. Uh, what happens is there comes a time in a controlled remote viewing session where you stop paying attention to your surroundings because you're so focused on the target. And all of a sudden, the impressions coming from your subconscious are so strong on your body yes. that you actually see the target, feel it, hear it, and so on. And I had been given this um, this uh, target on Mars, and it was underground. And uh, so I... Uh, I got really focused on this. Of course, I had no idea it was Mars because in controlled remote viewing, you never tell a viewer what the target is. Right. And um, so I I found this passageway out, and I walked out, and uh, and all of a sudden here was this red landscape far down below me. I was at a hole uh, in the side of this uh, slanted structure that was made out of old weathered stones and all. And um, um, I looked up, the sun was out, but it was dim, and it was, you know, things weren't right. Mm. And uh, there was an ice-cold wind on my face, and it was very cold. So anyway, uh, they told me that I had, you know, after I finished the session, wrote my summary, they told me I had viewed Mars. And I thought, okay, well, that's pretty neat. Uh, but the the thing was that that was the first PSI I had had, and all of a sudden, I was there. Mm-hmm. My mind was there, and uh, I could see it, touch it, taste it, feel the wind on my face and everything. Well, anyway, I was at a, um, uh installation, and uh, they had on their wall a an extremely high-resolution uh, picture of the Sedona region. And, you know, you see these pictures of the face on Mars and all that, and they're all blurry. Mm. Uh, come on, they can read license plates from 250 miles up. You really right. think that a mountain would be blurry. So anyway, this place had the uh, Sedona region, and there was this pyramid-type uh, hill, and I looked, and there was this little hole in it, and I remembered what I had seen from that hole. And sure enough, looking out from that pyramid, that's exactly where everything was. How and so interesting. It was, uh, it was an amazing, it's an amazing thing, really is. This work is, oh, I just, you know, I only went through the intermediate course, and I still am... I feel like I'm present, even talking with you, being back in Tempe, Arizona. You and I worked on a couple of cases together, and uh, I know how important this work can be with law enforcement. How are they receiving you, Lynn? Are are you working for families or agencies? Uh, we never work for families. Okay. Um, and anyone who does psychic work, I urge them to please never work for the family. Only work through the police. I agree with you. Uh, the police uh, gets badgered by the family mm-hmm. and so on. And it takes the family on an emotional roller coaster. Absolutely. You tell them something, they get high, and then the police won't do anything about it because it came from a psychic. And so they crash again. Right. It's not fair to anybody. Mm-mm. Only work through the police. And... Uh, uh, well, along with that, I'm I'm still adhering to Presidential Order 11905, uh, which says that I cannot uh, collect intelligence on U.S. citizens 
without due channels. And what are those due channels? Well, one do of the due channels is uh, uh, when working criminals, you have to work through the police. Mm-hmm. And uh, working for the family is is not due channels, and so it's against the law, basically, for me to work for a family. Good to know. Yeah, uh, because we were we were strapped with that presidential order that we could never. Uh, collect intelligence on U.S. citizens in any way unless directed by Congress. So, you know, uh, you've heard the old thing, it'd take an act of Congress to make me do that. <laughs> uh, in our case, that was very true. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but we um, we are doing work for police. Uh, we don't advertise. We let the police, uh, if they're satisfied with their work, we know they'll tell people. And... Uh, we have more business than we can really right do, right you know. well I, I think one of the fascinating things that I learned with you other than the technicalities of the controlled remote viewing is what we did with map um, can you explain to our listeners uh, a little bit about what we did with those maps and identifying targets uh, CRV teaches a new way, actually, or several new ways to do dowsing with maps. And uh, if I can use uh, one student as a uh, as an example, we took a large atlas page, and this student I had came named uh, Marla Free. <laughs> uh, we looked in the gazetteer in the back, and just at random picked out a town and uh, found out what page it was on. So we opened this huge atlas to that uh, to that page, and uh, you did the CRV thing. And as I remember, you were one thirty-second of an inch off an entire page. Uh, but you, I mean, you nailed that town. <laughs> well, and, and what was interesting is, is how you taught me how to do that, which was you would hold the paper. Of course, I never saw the, the, um, the map itself, but you would hold the paper, and I took a, a ruler and moved it down over the paper, and my subconscious would make my arms or hands do these sort of twitchy things, yeah. and you would draw a line, and well, you kept moving the paper the around, and... Every time I would twitch, you would draw the line, and where the apex or where those lines came together is what you put back on the map. Is that correct? That's right. Uh, this, again, is part of the physical nature of CRV. Right. This is a physical discipline, not a mental one. And so you drag that ruler down, and your subconscious will feel a bump or make a twitch or whatever in a physical way right where the target is. And I remember uh, in in practicing, uh, this was after the OJ case, um, we we were given a target of the killers of Ron Goldman and uh, Nicole Brown Simpson. Did, did and I, the I, map I did put me two blocks off of Rockingham. Oh, the police gave you that one, right? Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this, I mean, this is astounding for anybody who is oh, yeah, interested in, you know, we all have part, parts of us are detectives, you know, in our own lives. Yeah. But this is extraordinary work. So are where are you teaching now? What what can we do to find out where you are? Uh, I just got back from a teaching tour over in Ireland. But uh, for the most part... <laughs> How about in the United States? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, for the most part, I uh, teach here at my home in Alamogordo, New Mexico. Now, we now have a an excellent trainer for the basic course, and she teaches in uh, Amarillo, Texas. And I'm teaching the higher-level courses these days. So we all have to go to Alamogordo. Is that what you're saying? Uh, Well, we have a uh, thing that we have set up to where if someone will form a class, do all the arrangements, and get the students, uh, a minimum of about six students. Right then they will get the class for free. Sounds good to me. And, uh, you know, if they will organize the class, uh, organize the uh, the room, everything else. Where you're staying, et cetera. Mm-hmm. That's right. Uh-huh. 
and uh, you know work with us in doing that. Uh, <laughs> the uh, first Irish class, the uh, coordinator set up a, a room that was, I think, $150 a day. And uh, at the end of the course, I came back with, I think it was $27 <laughs> 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 for two weeks of training work over there. But, uh, but you know, uh, we, we make it so that if someone will act as a coordinator and do a really good job of it, then they get the course for free. And I think it's well worth the, uh, you know, it's well worth it to us, and I think it would be well worth it to anyone who would like to do that. Well, I, I think that anybody who's listening um, better write that down and, and make a note of it. So your schedule for the next year, um, you you have, you, you're available then, that's what you're saying? Uh, yeah, and we have not generated the uh, schedule for next year yet. My wife has been extremely ill. She had uh, an aneurysm and had brain surgery. Oh, I'm so sorry. And uh, and so she's been extremely ill, so we haven't gotten around to developing a target of uh, a uh, schedule for next year. However, if anyone wants to keep up with it, we will have that and we'll post it on our website. And your website is uh, www.crviewer.com, crviewer.com. Great. Well, let's take a little bit of a break, and we'll be right back. Sounds good. You're listening to Whitley Strieber's Dreamland Online with guest host Marla Fries. Welcome back to Dreamland. Lynn, in reference to health issues, are you doing any CRV on body stuff. We teach a course in uh, medical applications. Now, I imagine that you already know that in the United States, um, there's a law that says if it's not drugs, then it can't heal. And, Gee, I never heard that before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, that, um, you know, practicing healing or, or medical work without a license is uh, totally taboo. Mm. And uh, what we try to do is we try to um, uh, hook people up with a doctor of some kind that they can work with, and we always tell people that, uh, you know, the medical applications is a, uh, is a new and developing field, and that whatever happens... They have got to work with doctors. But um, um, we, teach, uh, we teach it in two phases. One is diagnostics, and the other is um, what we call influencing uh, because we can't call it healing. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. um, but what happens is you connect your subconscious to the subconscious of the sick person, Hmm. You find out what's wrong with them, and you know what's wrong on the surface may not be what's really wrong and causing it. And so Got you, it. You work diagnostics really deeply, and then once you find out what's really honestly wrong with them, then you do another session, and you uh, you know you plan your work. You do another session, and you go into their subconscious and you try to solve that problem so that then they can heal themselves. Are we talking uh, lifetimes here, going back into time? Uh, no. We're, uh, you could do that, but we're more immediate. We're more practical than that. Uh, uh, and what have you found? Is it, is it, a, is it a thought? Is it uh, uh, an emotional trauma? What are you finding? Uh, many times it's each of those are a combination of them, and many times it's uh, just, like I say, the person is doing something that they don't want to do and don't know why they do it, but they wind up doing it anyway, mm-hmm. and they wind up hurting themselves. Uh, uh, cigarettes right. are such an, I mean, until you've gotten into what it really causes, you don't know how much of a total evil on our civilization yeah, oh, it is. It, it's vile, isn't it? 
It really is. And the addict and the addictive properties of what nicotine does. I mean, thank God I just can't stomach it. But I I was with people last night. Three of them are are really really struggling, and they've done the hypnosis and they've done yeah. the drugs, and they are still having quite a time. Yeah, and tobacco is not the only thing that you know, that does that and uh, that has bad effects on people. Well, when you, when you talk to groups of people, what's, what's the main concern? What what do they want to, what do most people um, come to you when they want to train in CRV? What do they want to know? What do they want to learn for themselves? What do you hear? Many people come just because they're curious. Mm-hmm. And uh, we try to warn them ahead of time that this is a martial art, and just like any martial art, we teach you the training, and it's the practice of it that will develop those muscles and those pathways inside of you that will make it work best. Uh, we tell people that uh, we have a three-day class, and in those three days, you're not going to become a remote viewer. Mm-hmm. You have to go home and practice. Right. Right. Because of that, we uh, make a deal with anyone who takes a class that they can come back and retake that class as many times as they want for the rest of their life at no cost. Well, I need a refresher course. Well, but I, 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 have to, <laughs> I have to tell you that you, anybody who takes this course has to be very careful at lunch break, though, because if you've been working and you've been training and learning how to do this, Whatever you eat at lunch, you will crave for the rest of your life. Oh, really? Oh, my gosh. I, I think I every time I've trained with you, I have to be very careful because if I'm in Tempe, Arizona, and I go to um, a McDonald's and I order a quarter pounder with extra cheese, I swear I'll be craving that for, for months and months. I have never heard that before. I have to go back to the same restaurant that I ate it in. Hmm. Now, what what's going on there with the subconscious, Lynn? I think you're just patterning. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's what it must be. You yeah. you allow your subconscious to start working, and then it 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 wants to take over. Oh yeah, uh, and in fact, what you have to learn to do is to work with it. You can't let it take over, and you can't uh, boss it around. Um, you know, you've got to work the two of you in unison on any target, and once you do that, well, shoot. Uh, the sky's the limit. What what is what's the most exciting thing that you have recognized within the last year in in either training or doing some of these sessions yourself? I, did, I don't really know what the answer would be to that one because uh, you've seen the inside of a particle beam. So oh yeah, and you know I'm not um, I'm not surprised anymore by anything I see in my work or the students' works. But if I ever quit being amazed by it, I'll go back to programming computers. Sure. Um, it's it's totally fascinating. It's something that has just uh, absorbed my life, and I love it. Uh, I, I teach, and you know, people come, and they're they're closed, and uh, and so on, and all of a sudden they open up, and they see what they can really be, and. Um, I have had people call me, uh, you know, after practicing, after the uh, basic class, and tell me that they're like 40 years old, and for the first time in their life, they're awake. Oh. And uh, that's very rewarding to me. I, I really love that. Well, and I credit you, Lynn. I, and I, I tell everybody that I really did not feel validated as a psychic, even though, you know, you don't have to be a psychic, of course, to do this work, and, and most of the people who are really good at this aren't necessarily psychics, but it really wasn't until I, I trained with you because your your methodology and who you are as a person is just so validating. Well, this is, like I say, this is Ingo Swan's uh, methodology, but um, uh, it's, I, I think one of the things that I really like is when I see a natural psychic come in. And uh, for them, well, like for you, instead of trying to teach them the remote viewing part of controlled remote viewing, yes. I teach them the controls. 
Right. And, uh, you know, for natural psychics, one of the biggest problems they have is that they don't have control over it. <laughs> right. And, uh, and so uh, we hold a class once a year for natural psychics, for good natural psychics. And uh, in that class, we teach them only the controls, how to control their natural ability. And like I was saying earlier, uh, the the results that come from that, when you add this ability and the natural talent together, it's just phenomenal. I mean, I look at the people's work, and I think, you know, not on my best day could I ever do that. <laughs> well, it's it's so exciting, and I guess I'm coming down to Alamogordo really soon. So your book, The Seventh Sense, The Secrets of Remote Viewing as Told by a Psychic Spy for the U.S. Military, is just awesome. I I love the way you write. It's very clear. You go into you have some incredible stories here, um, and anybody who does take the opportunity to train with you. Go to lunch or dinner with Lynn, watch what you're eating, but listen to some of his amazing stories. And you've got some of the most incredible UFO experiences as well. Oh, yeah. Those uh, those things happen. You know, people ask me, uh, well, a guy asked me over the radio one time on an interview, he said, well, why do you think these things happen to you? And I said, I think they happened to everybody. I just right. started paying attention. Right, exactly. And because you're also the son of a Baptist minister, correct? Uh, the grandson of a Methodist minister. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you, you're, you're a systems buster, and you have to pave the way. Lynn, thank you so much for your time. It's well, just been for inviting me. so great to talk with you. And um, I'm excited to... You know, put the word out there for you. So give your um, your your uh, your web address one more time. Okay, it's C R V I E W E R C R Viewer dot com. Thank you so much. My best to Linda, and we'll talk with you later. Good. Thank you very much. This is Whitley Strieber's Dreamland. Next up, Linda Moulton Howe. Okay, folks, are, are your seat belts fastened? Because they need to be this time. Linda's back again, and as usual, as has been going on here for quite a few years now, she's got a mind bender. But okay, we're used to that. This is beyond that. Linda Moulton Howe's superb website is earthfiles.com where you get the facts that others will not tell you. And boy, I'm telling you this week, that is 1,000% true. She's an Emmy Award-winning science reporter for a reason. And reports like you are about to hear are the reason. Here she is from Albuquerque, Linda Moulton Howe. Thank you, Whitley. And it's true. The reports that keep coming to me seem to be stranger and stranger and repeating patterns over this year of 2008. And it was back on the early morning of October 23rd to 24th, as the clock switched from midnight into October 24th. I was on Coast to Coast AM with George Nori when in my phone section I got a uh, call in the very last half hour live from a truck driver named Tim Comstock. He was excited to tell what he had seen, what would be the night before, or in 3.45 a.m. on October 23rd in Empire, Ohio. And what he described on the phone was a triangle of lights and a glowing object below that was rising up into or toward this triangular craft, and he could see a dark crystalline surface and he felt that the glowing object was somehow organic. He referred to it as a cocoon. Tim took three photos of the object on his cell phone, which I reported in an October 31st, 2008 Earth Files report. It is still there with all the photos and maps at www.earthfiles.com. There's a hot link on the headlines page from that October 31st report. Well, after that, 
I have received more reports from Ohio residents provoked enough by Tim Comstock's photographs at Earth Files to contact me about their own sightings of the triangle and the very strange glowing pod, some of them call it, or cocoon, as Tim described it, rising up into the triangular craft. Today on Dreamland, I want to begin with a security guard that I will call Sarah, who works in the Stratton and Empire, Ohio region. The largest company there is the W.H. Samus Coal Power Plant, and about 40 miles northeast are two nuclear power plants owned and operated by First Energy Corporation. The plants are called the Bruce Mansfield Plant and the Beaver Valley Power Station, both in shipping port on the Pennsylvania side of the Ohio River. Sarah is 48 years old, was born and raised in the Steubenville, Ohio region, north of Empire, and has worked as a security guard for the past 11 years. She was very surprised to learn about Tom or Tim Comstock's photographs at Earth Files from October 23rd because two and a half months earlier, in the first week of August 2008, Sarah was on security duty around midnight when she saw a triangular pattern of lights, quote, just like the one in Tim Comstock's photos, unquote. And then again on October 23rd at 3.45 a.m., while Tim Comstock had slowed his big truck down to about two miles an hour on the new Route 7 south of Empire to watch the amazing lights and snap the three images on his cell phone. Sarah was maybe three-tenths of a mile further north on the old Route 7, watching the exact same phenomenon, but from a slightly different angle. But now she's going to begin first with the August sighting. The first time I saw the triangular-shaped one was in the beginning of August of 2008. I was at work. I was sitting at our north gate, and my dad always taught me that you learn many things looking at the sky, so I'm a sky watcher. And I was looking at the different stars and everything, and this one section north of the plant, the stars just suddenly just seemed to disappear. As I was watching it, there was these three bright, like a yellowish-white light that appeared. They were triangular shaped. You couldn't see any form like 3D form to it, but it was three lights. And these three lights kind of hovered for a while, and they would get bright, and then they would go a little bit duller, like they would have a little bit of orange mixed into them. So it hovered for a while, and then it moved up, straight up in the sky, then it moved towards the east, and it stopped, and it started to go north, and then it kind of zigzagged from west to east, and then it took off straight up. It was almost faster than your eyes could follow it. Do you remember the date in August? I believe it was like the 5th or the 6th, right around midnight. But at that time in August, it did not have the 3D pod under it. It didn't have that one in August. And there was one person that was working that night that said that they had seen something, but they were up a little bit further north than where I was. And they said that they saw something that blocked out the stars and there was bright light. Sarah did not talk to anyone else about that early August sighting of the triangle pattern of lights that moved so strangely. But three months later, at 3.45 a.m. on October 23, 2008, not only was Sarah seeing the triangle pattern of round lights again, but rising below the triangle of lights was a totally mysterious, large, glowing object that she refers to as a pod while the truck driver, Tim Comstock, felt it was somehow alive and organic and called it a cocoon. Tim could not stop his truck and never saw what happened when the glowing cocoon or pod reached the triangle of lights. But Sarah did, and now continues her description of what happened after she again sees stars disappearing above her. I was doing a patrol down at our abandoned trial plant. I was coming northbound on Old Route 7, looking at the sky, and 
I noticed that the stars were disappearing. I pulled off the side of the road, and I noticed these three really bright lights. They were circular shaped, and they were almost like looking into a spotlight. There were three of them. They formed like a triangular shape, and it just hovered above the trees, and there was this pod, like a 3D pod shape, that was a bright yellowish orange that was raising up, and it came from like the trees, went up towards a triangle-shaped object. The closer it got, the more you could see that there was a bottom between the three bright circular lights, and it was like a dark charcoal gray to a black, and it had a real rough texture like aluminum foil crumbled up and you straighten it up. So kind of a crystalline, crinkly surface. Yes. I wonder if you could describe the pod as you're looking at it a little more in terms of color, what exactly you're seeing, and what happens as it rises toward the triangular configuration of light. The bottom of it almost looked like if you were looking at the bottom of a boat, how it's like the oval, but yet it has a ridge through the middle of it. It kind of looked like that, and then it almost like squared off going further up. And from the way I was looking at it, it looked almost like a bright yellowish orange in color. It was glowing. Yes. And how far do you think that you were from that rising cocoon or pod in relationship to where Tim Comstock was? From there, I was probably three-tenths of a mile further north than what he was. The 3D pod kept raising up. I never saw an opening in the bottom of the craft, but it was like the bottom of it, as the pod got closer, it was like the craft kind of like sucked it in, or I can't explain. It was like the pod just suddenly disappeared. Mm-hmm. And then the bright lights, they hovered there for a few minutes, and then they just shot up. Intuitively, did you have any instinct about what you were watching? At first, no. When I just saw the light, I wasn't sure what it was. But then when I saw the 3D pod shape coming up, then it wasn't anything that I had ever seen. Meaning that the glowing object was rising into that craft that had the three triangular lights? Yes. My immediate thought was that I had just witnessed another UFO. Not from this planet? No. Can you explain why you felt that? So strongly? Probably because I've seen several odd objects in the sky or hovering over that area at night. What other times have you seen UFOs there? There was probably 2006. It was in July. I was on a mobile round and I had stopped at the North Gate, talked to one of my friends that was down there, and we were standing outside talking. And there was a disc shaped object that was between us and the smokestacks for the power plant. The smokestacks are probably, from that guard shack, they're probably only like maybe a tenth of a mile away. And these are smokestacks at the WH Samus power plant? Yes. And this object appeared to the west of the plant at first, between where we were standing at and the smokestacks. And at first, we kind of thought it was a star. But then it dropped down to probably maybe treetop level, and it went east, which put it right between where we were and the smokestacks. And you could see the different color lights. There was blue, there was orange, there was yellow, there was red. There was an odd color that you couldn't even put a name to it. Doing circles around the object. As if there was some other glowing object rotating or orbiting around the larger object? Yes. And then what happened? It kind of like hovered there for a little bit, and then it shot off towards the east. So how many times do you think you've seen these strange zigzagging lights? I would say probably close to 50 times, if not more. I just sent you an email not too long ago about the other object that we saw. I was down at the Toronto plant. And I was looking at the sky and up above a little town, probably about five miles south of Empire. There was a bright light in the sky. It was too high to distinguish exactly what shape it was, but it had the multicolored lights going around it. 
first blues would go around it. Then there was the red, there was the orange, there was the yellow. And I motioned for one of the contractors that was down there to look. And him and I stood there and watched it. But it just hovered there for probably a good five minutes. How close to the ground? Oh, it was way up in the sky. It was probably three, 4,000 feet, if not more. But was it large? Yes. If you extended your hand right now, arm's length, would your hand cover it? It might barely cover it. So you're talking about something larger than the full moon in the sky? Yeah, pretty much. That night it was. I mean, it was huge. These multicolored lights, were they spinning around the perimeter? Yes. They were going from left to right. Flashing on and off? Not really flashing on and off, but it would circle it. You could almost see like a trail behind it. First, there was a blue one that circled it, and you could see the trail. And then there was an orange one that circled it, and you could see the trail. And then it went to red, and you could see the trail. And then there was a yellow one that went around it. Another surprising discovery after I posted my Earth Files news report about Tim Comstock's photos of the highly strange triangle of lights and the glowing pod or cocoon rising up into it came from Midvale, Ohio, about an hour's drive west of Empire. Midvale is in Tuscarawas County and has a population of about 550. One young resident there is 22 years old, recently married, and goes by the nickname Joy. Joy has insomnia and is often up after midnight, as she was in the early morning hours of Sunday, November 2nd. Here now is Joy to describe what she saw. The last time I looked at the clock, it was 2.33 a.m., and it was on November 2nd. I'm usually up late watching TV. I decided to go over and have a cigarette, which I always sit at the desk to do, right beside the window. And something caught my eye out the window, and I looked out to see a very large, orangish, yellowish, whitish orb, for lack of a better word. It didn't seem to keep one shape. I saw it at the edge of the tree line behind my house. And when you say it didn't keep a shape, can you explain that? It just seemed to kind of waver around. In your email to me, you described it as watching an amoeba moving. Yes. It looked like um, as if you were looking under a microscope, the little blobs that you see, how they sort of just wiggle around. Amoebas. Yeah. So this was glowing, but it was changing shape rapidly. Yes. And it was rising at the same time? It moved horizontally and... It was changing shape, but it wasn't, like, going up or down. It was just following a straight line through the tree line. Then it dipped down behind the trees, and when it did that, I could see the silhouette of the trees in front of it, but I could not see the trees behind it as if it were solid. After that, it hung in the air in the same spot for probably less than 30 seconds, moved backwards and upwards a little bit, And then, a lot more rapidly than it had been moving, it moved forward, but further away from me, and up, way higher than the tree line. And it seemed, from the distance I could tell in the dark, it moved about a few football field lengths away from where the back of my house is, where it had been moving steadily parallel to the house. It moved away and up. So I can't tell exactly how far the lights were in the triangular pattern, Mm -hmm. but I didn't even notice those lights until I saw it reach them, and I realized there were dim lights in that pattern. And uh, after it reached it, from the angle that it was at, I couldn't see any reflection, but right away I called a friend who lives on the next road over and asked her if anything was going on. She said there was something behind her house, approximately over the wooded area that's right behind our first road in town. Is she the neighbor who said her dog was going crazy? Yes. Could you hear any animals around your area? Yes, but they are always barking, the ones that are closest to me. Mm -hmm. But they were going absolutely crazy that night. From your perspective, this glowing amoeba-changing object rose up to a 
triangular pattern of whitish lights in the sky and disappeared? Yes. It reached it, and it hung there for a few moments, and then all the lights went out as if somebody just flipped the switch and turned them off. As you were staring from the window, did you have any intuitive flash in your mind about what it might be? I didn't until afterwards. Um, I was just kind of frozen to the window, and I'm—I was so shocked because it was just so odd. It takes you by surprise. There's something that close right to you, and there's no way to explain what it is. And I just watched it, and I—I'm surprised that I actually even had the common sense to open the window to get a better look. I was just kind of hypnotized by it, you know. I didn't want to run for the camera and then lose it and it go out of sight or it vanish. I wanted to see what it did, where it went. It just all these things going through my head, like what could it be? How far do you think it was from you? It was about a large backyard distance away from me. Less than 300 feet away? Yeah. The color was what orange that I might know? It was a little lighter than pumpkin orange. With some yellow and white running through it. And when you say that, how is the yellow and white mixed in with the orange? It wasn't coming from the center of it, but it looked as if it just were bouncing around inside of it. Barely, like just soft yellows and white. Was the object that was changing shape, did it ever give you the impression that it was spinning? Not spinning, necessarily but tilting a little. Tilting. Even though it was changing shape, it appeared that there was a front and a back to it because whenever it stopped and backed up, it started to tilt as if it were turning, like, towards one direction or the other, then went back horizontally, and instead of turning around, it just backed up, like, reverse, and then went forward. And you could see it tilt when it was making those back and forward motions? Yes. Now, this was not very far from you. Could you hear any sound? No sound whatsoever except the dog. My dog inside of the house was, and he's, he's not in the same room. Um, he's kept in a cage at night, and he'd been whimpering and whining all night. When you think of November 2nd and staring at the amoeba orange object that then finally rises up into the triangle of lights, does anything come into your mind that is associated with what might be in the glowing light or the triangle? That's what I wonder. I mean, I tried to come up with any possible explanation. Uh, what could this be? And it didn't seem to be a man-made object or anything mechanical or a spotlight or a flashlight beam or anything. It was different than anything I'd ever seen. And I am hoping that some of our Dreamland listeners, hearing this report from two people in the Midvale and Empire, Ohio area, might get in touch with me at my email address, earthfiles at earthfiles.com. If they have seen anything like this glowing, we'll call it pod, rising up to a triangular configuration of lights. I am very curious to know if this might be happening anywhere else beyond the Empire and Midvale, Midvale region of Ohio, and if it is confined there, Whitley, does it mean that there is something about the very old and large coal mine or those two nuclear plants not very much further north that we're trying to confirm if any of that water from the plants ends up in that Ohio River down at the Empire and Stratton area, there is a lot more to learn. And next week on Dreamland, as amazing as this seems today, I have one of the most powerful reports from a law enforcement officer that I think that I have ever in my entire career heard and this is one of the police officers who has finally come forward after an almost year of silence to talk about what he saw over the Erath County Courthouse in Stephenville, Texas. If you put them all together from January 2008 up to through November of 2008, what has been happening both in Texas and Ohio is really quite 
beyond most reports in all of the previous decades in many ways, including what is the size of these craft, these huge craft that seem to have a crystalline-like surface. Well, Linda, I can, <laughs> all I can say is uh, I've got to gather up my teeth, which I've dropped, and I'm going to drop them again Next week, that was quite an extraordinary report. So listen up, folks, for what we're going to hear next week. I think it's going to be at least as incredible. Also next week, Ann Streber will be talking to Orbs expert Antonia Scott Clark. Ann Streber was surrounded by Orbs at the Dreamland Festival. A lot of people took pictures of them, and she's been curious ever since. What are they? Well, we're going to have an expert who's going to tell her we hope next week on Dream. Uh, natural Psychic. They, um, they found out that the uh, Russians had psychic spies, and they had a really good laugh over that, you know. Right. But then they realized, yeah, but they're getting our secrets. Mm. And uh, so all of a sudden somebody started taking it seriously. And so they figured, well, if the Russians have it, we have to have it, too. What year was that, Lynn? Oh, that was back in, I think, 69 or 70, somewhere around there. Okay. Uh, it, was a, it was a process that went through, you know, the realization, the finding out that the uh, Russians had it and so forth. And uh, so it was, a, it was a decision that was, you couldn't put an exact date on but the uh, uh, U.S. military, because of the politics in the United States and everything, did not want to use psychics. So they uh, went out to Stanford Research, where a man named uh, Dr. Hal Putoff had been doing some research on uh, what's now called non-locality. Mm. Um, how the how the mind can perceive things um, that you know are beyond the five normal senses, and so they gave him a grant of around fifty thousand dollars to develop some kind of a method, and um, he got in touch with a man named Pat Price, who was a retired. Or anger that shut it down. Uh, I looked around and everybody was laughing at me, you know. And I looked in the doorway and there was this other sergeant. And he mouthed "gotcha" and pointed his finger at me, and I got flaming, flaming angry. Mm -hmm. Well, I have always had this uh, problem with anger that when I get really, really mad, something <laughs> dies. something will break. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so, anyway, the computer station went down, and uh, for the a time that's still classified, in fact, uh, we had no intelligence effort in uh, along the uh, German border. Oh my gosh! And so, anyway, um, uh, this general, General Stubblebein, had heard about the incident, and he came out a few months later and. Uh, uh, stood me at attention and had this scowl on his face, and he said, did you kill my computers with your mind? <laughs> and that was the last thing in the world I expected any general to say to me. <laughs> and uh, I was standing there thinking, my great-grandchildren are going to be paying for computers, <laughs> and uh, I could lie about this, and nobody would know, you know. And sort of out of my mouth, I heard the words, yes, sir, I did. Um. <laughs> and anyway, the scowl disappeared, and this grin came over his face, and he said, far effing out, <laughs> have I ever got a job for you? <laughs> um, policeman and a man named Ingo Swan, who had been doing some research in this, and they developed a technique that could be used by just the common soldier on the ground to uh, emulate the the work of a natural psychic. Well, I think the the aspects of controlled remote viewing is is so important because you know people are throwing the idea around that oh I can remote view I can remote view but this is this is a highly skilled detailed uh, way to do this. 
Oh, yes. It's a uh, martial art of the mind, really. That's a wonderful way of putting it. So how long did it take Ingo to develop this protocol? Oh, uh, several years. I think he had been developing this protocol long before he got in touch with uh, Al Putoff. And um, basically they brought uh, they brought Ingo into the laboratory and they said, you know, uh, tell me what's in the box. <clears throat> and Ingo basically said, Hey, you're wasting my time and talents. If you want to know what's in the box, open the box. <laughs> and uh, he said, give me the coordinates for any place in the world, and I'll tell you what's there and what's going on there. Wow. And so they tried it out on several places, and he did just exactly that. And um, so they started codifying what could be done with this methodology and uh, designing it so that, you know, you could pull a a grunt soldier off the battleground, teach him how to do this, and send him back so he could tell his commander what was over the hill and where to point the guns and things like that. Well, so how did they pull you all together to do this? Uh, They had had the unit for about 10 years before I got there. Um, Due to a psychokinesis incident that happened in... uh, over in Augsburg, Germany. Oh, you are you going to share that? Because it's quite a story. <laughs> oh, please. Oh, if, if listeners are going to hear anything today, they've got to hear this story. I had spent about five months working, uh, developing a computer program that would tie together all of the uh, computers within the U.S. Uh, intelligence field station over in Germany. Now, we had computers from 12 different companies, uh, uh, countries, and uh, old computers, new computers, everything, you know, and they weren't talking to each other. So anyway, I got the program written after about five months. And uh, this other sergeant had been extremely angry because he wanted the job to do it. And so when the day came for me to show my program, he sabotaged it, and I had the generals from 12 different countries sitting there, <laughs> I hit the enter key, and uh, the entire fuel station went dead. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, I... Was it your... Welcome to Dreamland. This is Marla Freeze. Well, my guest today has worked for over 17 years for the military and has trained hundreds of students in remote viewing. His company, PSI, Problems, Solutions, and Innovations, is dedicated to training people in the strict science of controlled remote viewing and has offered the services to private citizens, companies, agencies, and other customers who need information which cannot be gained through any other means. His book, which we'll be talking about today, The Seventh Sense, is an in-depth account of the secrets of remote viewing as told by a psychic spy for the U.S. military. He is a terrific teacher and an all-around great guy, and I am so honored to have him on our program today. Welcome, Lynn Buchanan. Hey, that introduction makes me want to meet me. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> well, well, that's the truth. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Well, uh, Lynn, I know that there's so many listeners who are interested in what remote viewing really is. So how can you, can you give us a little overview of what controlled remote viewing is? Okay, I'm glad you said controlled remote viewing because that is the method that was used by the U.S. military for intelligence gathering for, oh, close to 20 years. And um, I was the military trainer in that unit uh, the last years I was in service. But the controlled remote viewing is a science that was developed in the laboratory at Stanford Research Institute um, to mimic the work of 